Hi. In this video, I want to talk about benchmarks. When you're doing machine learning, you are often interested in how effective a technique is, which means that you'll try out the technique on some data sets in an attempt to come to a benchmark. But the unfortunate truth is that meaningful benchmarks are super hard to get right. And in this video, I would like to give you an example of what I mean by this. And to explain that, what we will do is we'll go over a benchmark that I have done on a data set that deals with intent classification. It's going to be slightly counterintuitive, but I hope that by the end of this video, I have convinced you that we might need to take some of these benchmarks with a grain of salt, especially if they are about the intent classification task. Now, to do a benchmark, you will need to have a data set to start with. And while looking around the Hugging Face data API, I found this out of scope intent classification data set. Originally, it can also be found as part of a research paper. The title and the authors are shown here, but the contents of the data set are relatively straightforward. On the left here, I have text, and on the right, I've got a label. And the goal I have in mind is that I can receive this text as input and predict the appropriate class as output. What's interesting about this data set is that there is one particular class, this OOS one, and the idea behind that class is that it's supposed to be out of scope. I'm listing some of the out of scope examples here. And in total, we seem to have about 1200 of these examples. Now these examples all fit a generic label given for user commands to a dialog system that cannot be handled by the system. It's like asking your smart speaker to fetch a glass of milk from the fridge. But you could argue that it's a class of text that we don't intend to handle. For all intents and purposes in my benchmark though, I am just going to consider this to be one of the labels that I'm interested in. But one thing that is interesting to demonstrate is that this data set isn't small. There are 151 different entities in this data set, and each entity has 150 examples, except for the out of scope label, which we saw before has 1200 examples. So that's the data set, and let's now talk about the benchmarking task. The idea is that I'll start with some text, and this text needs to be turned into features for a machine learning task. So I will apply a count vector featureizer, which will take every word and index it. I will do the same thing again, but for the subwords. And I'm also going to be attaching a embedding. Now note that all of these featureization steps output some sort of a vector. And that means that I can concatenate all of these things together. That means that at this point, I have a single large vector. And then this is passed to a simple logistic regression, which is going to classify the text as one of the labels. The main thing that I'll be benchmarking are the embeddings over here. I'm curious to see what would happen if I put fast text in there. And I would like to compare that to the universal sentence encoder, which for all intents and purposes is a BERT-like model in a sense that it's a contextualized embedding. And I'm also going to compare that against having no embedding at all. And it's the effect of this embedding that I am largely interested in. It's not the only thing though, because I'm also interested in measuring something else. You see, for the benchmark, I will be using a train set as well as a test set. And this test set is static. It will have about 4,000 examples. And note that I'm making sure for both of these sets that the proportion of labels is equal. I'm applying stratified sampling here. But the thing that's really interesting about this train set is that we could argue that, well, the effect of the embeddings that we have over here, those might also depend on the train set that goes into the model. And to be specific, I could say, well, let's only pass 1000 examples of our train set into the algorithm, 
and then we can measure how well we perform on the test set. But what happens if we pick 2,000 examples, or 3,000, etc.? What I find interesting about this thought experiment is that you could argue that perhaps the effect that the embedding has in terms of generalization also depends on the size of your train set. If your train set isn't very large, adding embeddings might contribute to overfitting. And I can also argue that it might be interesting to understand the effect of the train size, because it might give us a hint that the best thing that we can do is not maybe add more embeddings, but instead to add more training data. So this is the setup that I'll be running. The main two things that I'll be changing in my benchmark are the train size and the embeddings, but I'll be measuring the effect on the test set, and I'll also measure the time that it takes to run. In the interest of time, I won't be discussing the code in this video, but rest assured that the code is publicly available on a GitHub repo, so you can reproduce everything that I'm doing here. So feel free to check that out on your own time. What I would like to do now is show you the results from this benchmark. So here are the results. I've done a big grid search, and I am showing all the results in a parallel coordinates chart below here. Now, to be specific, I am using Highplot as a tool to visualize here. And what's really convenient about the tool is it allows me to make a subselection. In this case, I'm selecting the fast text embeddings, and I can immediately see what the effect was on all the other metrics. For example, if I hover my mouse over the examples where the time taken was very long, then we can indeed see that those instances were for the heavyweight embeddings and also for the large train sizes, all of which makes sense. There are a few things I would like to point out here that I think are interesting. For starters, note that the instances here where the accuracy for the test set is very high, those correspond with instances where the accuracy on the train set was slightly lower. Now, the axis over here, of course, is on a completely different scale than over here. But it is interesting to see that the higher the test accuracy is, the more it is able to escape the 100% accuracy on the train set, which indeed is an indication that there's a movement towards generalizing at some point. However, if I were now to select maybe the top performing test cases here, then I hope you recognize that it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case that that's dependent on the embedding that we pick, but instead it seems to be highly dependent on the train size. Another way of visualizing this effect is to make this selection at the bottom here and then interactively move the train size up, up, and up while comparing to the accuracy on the test set. And also here, I hope you would agree that there indeed seems to be a very strong relationship between a train size and the accuracy on the test set. So that's worth to explore further. What you see here is another visualization. On the x-axis here, I'm showing the train size. And on the y-axis here, you're looking at the accuracy of the test set. There are three lines that I'm drawing, one for the universal sentence encoder, one for fast text, and one for the situation where there are no embeddings besides the count vectors. There seems to be something of a difference, but by and large, I hope you would agree, looking at this chart over here, that the main effect, really, is the effect of the train size. If we zoom in a bit here, there indeed seems to be something of an uplift here if we go ahead and use the universal sentence encoder, but the difference in the embeddings really pales in comparison compared to the size of the training data. Now this effect does smooth out a bit as we get more training examples. But even if we zoom in at the very end here, we can choose to focus on the difference between the universal sentence encoder and the other embeddings, 
But again, I hope you would agree that the difference isn't that big. It makes about a 0.5% difference. And if you consider the amount of extra training time it might take to use this embedding, then we can wonder if it's worth it. Especially if you consider that there is still something of a slope here. We still see the accuracy increase when we add more data, so that might be a very worthwhile pursuit to still investigate. Another thing to observe is that there is a difference between the fast text embeddings and the setting with just the count vectors, but that difference really is just tiny. So let's now once again come back to the topic of doing a meaningful benchmark. I hope that you would agree that we can zoom in on the effect of these embeddings, but that we would really be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't consider the effect of the train size. There is also another observation. Let's say that we did this benchmark without this basic count vector strategy, and that we only compared fast text against the universal sentence encoder. Should we really report that the universal sentence encoder is the best if a simple count vector model performs nearly the same? Or should we maybe conclude that if the count vector model really works, that maybe the task is reasonably simple? If the simplest model out there can handle the task quite well, then maybe what the benchmark should be telling us is that there's less of a need to use the big fancy model. And that means that it's super important to always add a very basic model as part of your benchmark. Because if you don't, then you might not get the biggest hint of all. Namely, that you should have a critical look at your data set before you consider any benchmark on it to be very meaningful. And this goes beyond just collecting more data for your training set. This would also include asking the question whether or not the task is hard and or representative of a problem that you're currently solving. So to wrap up this video, let's have another look at this data set. And the main thing that we'll be trying to focus on is to answer this meaningful part of the question. What you're looking at here is the big list with all the different intents that we have in our data set. If you just have a look at the names of these intents, then you might start noticing something. We have some intents about bills, booking a hotel or a flight, something about calories as well, even something about credit card limits and cooking. Looking at all of these separate intents, you might seriously ask the question, is this data set really representative of a virtual assistant that is live and talking to end users? Or might it be fair to say that reality is bound to be more complex than what this data set represents? In reality, I can imagine that some of the intents that I have in a live virtual assistant, that they might overlap in terms of words that are being used. But if I consider what is happening in this data set, looking at all these different intents, then I might argue that these intents are actually quite separate as far as word use is concerned. And this suggests that this data set represents a task that might be easier than real life. And also note that this benchmark only captures the intent prediction part of the virtual assistant. It has no notion of context in a conversation, and we're also not at all talking about how to handle fallback situations. And sure, it's a benchmark. It's reasonable to look at the results on this data set and wonder what lessons we might be able to learn from it. But we always need to remember that reality is more complex than a CSV file. It's also just a single experiment that we've done here. When you're trying to draw a conclusion, you never want to make a judgment on a complex system from just looking at one result from one experiment. We should also remember that our end users won't care if our F1 score is amazing on a CSV file. Our end users will only care about having a working assistant that understands their needs. And it's our end users that in the end are the only meaningful benchmark that counts.